the most common one you're going to find is this supposed uh, correlation or connection between Jesus and Horus and saying uh, that would be one of them. So they would say that the the things that the Bible says about Jesus are actually um, said about Horus, you know, in, in texts that predate the Gospels. And therefore, that's evidence uh, that, you know, that, you know, that parallel is evidence that, you know, the the that Jesus is a myth that was you know taken from. Kim. So let me just give a quick example. I guess probably maybe the most uh, familiar one might be uh, this notion that Jesus was born on December 25th, because <clears throat> that's when we celebrate Christmas. And then um, they would say the horse was born on December 25th as well in a similar type of scene. And there you go. You've got some kind of parallel that, that, that you know, demonstrates that, that the, uh, the narrative about Christ was taken from Kim. That's what they would say. Thank you for watching another episode of the Jew3 Project podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew3 Project. And today I'm so excited to bring someone um, who I've known for a, a, a good bit, um, Mr. Adam Coleman. Welcome, Adam. Hey, how's it going? How's it going? Oh, man. It's going well. It's going well. I'm still getting the hang of this new uh, system. We used to use Google Hangouts, and it would switch back and forth from the from the person who was talking automatically. So when I have to switch back and forth myself, sometimes I forget. Um, okay, I'm just, you have to excuse me because I'm actually uh, you know broadcasting from my homeschooling section of my house. So I got this position <laughs> table sign here in the background. It's looking really real crazy right now. So <laughs> move that out the way. Yeah. <laughs> no. no. Homeschool is real nowadays. <laughs> no problem. No problem at all. Uh, for those who don't know who you are, just give them a little bit about yourself. I'm sorry, I lost you there for a second. Uh, can you repeat that? For those who aren't familiar with who you are, just give them a little bit of background about who you are. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm you know, Adam Coleman, you know, as, as you said, and um, I'm a uh, Christian apologist. Uh, three or so years ago, I started a uh, podcast called the True ID Podcast, um, and which basically it stands for the Real You in My Go Day. And uh, basically, you know, I was just grappling with the, the same kinds of questions that you deal with on your podcast all the time, you know, and, and with uh, the G three as a whole, um, just questions about is Christianity the white man's religion? You know, what's up with Christians, uh, Africans, and slavery? You know, all those kinds of things. And you know, as I was grappling with these questions. Um, I just didn't know of any resources, you know, that were engaged in them. And I figured, well, there's probably other people out there that are, you know, dealing with this stuff just like I am. And so I decided, like, you know, well, hey, you know, why don't I do something about it? You know, maybe I can, you know, hop in, hop in here and give my two cents and hopefully bless somebody. So I launched a Triad podcast a little bit over, uh, I guess, yeah, just over three years ago. And uh, I've been rocking and rolling ever since, man, you know, trying to, uh, you know, do the best I can to uh, answer questions for people. And so, you know, aside from that, you know, uh, as I started doing the podcast, uh, job you know, opportunities open up to, you know, do speaking engagements and, you know, write articles. And so now I'm, I'm up to my eyeballs and, you know, just, you know, ministry and, and trying to, you know, stay afloat, you know, while uh, keep, you know, keep giving people uh, answers and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, that, that's me in a nutshell, man. I'm just a guy who, who loves the Lord, loves to read. And out of, I guess out of, out of those two things, you know, God uh, made a ministry. So that and that's where I'm at now. That's what's up. I first met you, Adam, in San Antonio. Yeah. Um, at the ETS Apologetics. I mean, EPS Apologetics right. Conference. So, um, it's, uh, it's interesting to see uh, how our paths um uh, have grown since since first meeting. So, um, it's good to yeah, have yeah. you. It's good to have you on on the podcast today. Um, we're going to talk about something that I know that you have spent a lot of time researching: cometicism. Uh, for those who don't know anything about uh, cometicism, kind of just give them a cometicism one hundred and one overview. Mm, okay, cool, cool. So I guess we can kind of start with uh, defining cometicism, and then we'll you'll we'll kind of work our way through a little bit. Uh, first of all, you know, we kind of probably should define the word chemic. It was like the root word of uh, cometicism. So um, uh, chemic is, you know, what they would say would be the indigenous word for Egypt. You know, so, I, you know, throughout this you know, presentation, I'll be using those two words interchangeably. So when you're dealing with cometics and you're using the word Egypt, a lot of times they'll, you know, hop on you and be like, nah, 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 brother. You know what I'm saying? You know, we, you know, we don't go by that's the, uh, the, you know, the Greek name for it. You know, be, you know it's called chemic. So that's kind of the, the root word uh, behind cometicism. Now, broadly speaking, 
Uh, Kemeticism would refer to those who are the worldview that draws from the history, philosophy, and most often the spirituality of ancient Egypt uh, as folks shape their worldview. You know, um, now with that said, you know, I do want to make sure that I say that comedics are not all monolithic. I mean, just like, you know, here in the church, you know, we've got different denominations and different perspectives. It's the same way with, with the comedic, uh, you know, community, right? Um, now, with that being said, I would say that there are two broad um, variations of, of comedicism, if you will, uh, what I refer to as comedic spiritualists and comedic non-spiritualists. And maybe we can kind of, you know, uh, break that down further as we go. <clears throat> but broadly speaking, uh, comedic spiritualists uh, would be those folks who uh, not only subscribe to the history and philosophy, but they also draw from the uh, the spiritual practices of ancient uh, Kemet in some sense or another and practice it and subscribe to it in their daily lives. Whereas the comedic non-spiritualists, just like it sounds, they may draw from the philosophy and the history and the heritage of ancient Egypt or your Kemet, uh, but they don't necessarily subscribe to um, you know, Kemeticism in a spiritual sort of way. You know, they tend to, uh, you know, look at it as just, you know, a heritage sort of a thing that they can maybe draw some insights from, but they wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, subscribe to the the, um, the deities and, and things of that nature that come along with uh, Kemeticism. So that's kind of, you know, in a nutshell, and maybe we can get into, you know, breaking down their specific beliefs, you know, if, if you like. Yeah. Um, what will be some of the basic um, tenets of their their beliefs? Okay, great. So um, what I'll do is I'll kind of address them, um, you know, you know, both ind individually. So we'll start with the uh, comedic non-spiritualist. Now they they may take exception to this, but you know, one thing I I, uh, I would describe it as being somewhat of a Kemet flavored atheism is really what it comes down to. So what they'll say is that the uh, gods and goddesses of Egypt um, would be, you know, or more so represent some sort of scientific reality, like a, uh, you know, energy or something of that nature, or some principle that exists in, in the natural world, but it's not so much a spiritual thing. So the comedic non-spiritualists would look at um, that the Egyptian her heritage uh, and uh, spiritual claims in that manner. It's kind of in a more natural sense. And so, you know, many times, uh, or most often, those types will say, well, you know, there is no God, but we can still draw from uh, you know, the, the myths and su such, you know, so forth, uh, you know, life lessons and maybe even some scientific, uh, you know, realities. Uh, now, the comedic spiritualists, um, I would argue that they pretty much are like a comedic flavored pantheism. So, you know, this is where we kind of can, you know, get a little, uh, get a little more in depth. But the comedic spiritualists, which is probably the kind that you're uh, most can you, often. Can you define pantheism for our audience? Because I'm not sure everybody knows what that is. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can definitely break that down. So uh, pantheism is, you know, the belief that everything is one and saying like the, there's an ultimate reality. So basically, you know, uh, what we refer to as the physical world or if there is some sort of non-physical world, whatever, everything that exists is one thing. You know what I'm saying is, is one thing. So that's what pantheism you know, basically is. So, you know, the word pan is kind of, you know, this in there means all and then theism. Uh, it, it refers to God. Theos refers to God. So pantheism, everything is God. Everything all taken together is God. So maybe another way to look at it <clears throat> would be that, you know, in Christianity, obviously, we have the most high God who is his own distinct entity, you know, saying above everything else. Well, with pantheism, the being that occupies that most high spot is everything in totality, right? So everything, you know, occupies that most high spot. Um, you know, in, in their perspective. And so basically what um, comedics, you know, the comedic spiritualists will do is they kind of take that concept and they, you know, give a uh, Egyptian spin to it. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, shout out to my man, uh, Vince Bantu, Dr. Vince Bantu. Uh, he recently did a, a debate with a uh, comedic priest by the name of Brother Jabari, which is a great debate. Y'all should definitely check it out on Epiphany Fellowship's uh, channel on YouTube. But anyway, you know, uh, right at the end of that uh, debate during the Q&A, uh, Brother Jabari, who was a comedic uh, priest, was asked, you know, what it is that they believe. And he actually describes exactly what I just said. They, they take everything physically and, and whatever you might imagine. Anything that exists is all a part of the one. And in, in any sort of differentiation between myself and anything else is really just an illusion. You know, rea the reality is we're all just kind of, you know, one entity all taken together. Does that, does that make sense or? Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Cool. So, uh, yeah. So the comedic spiritualists, uh, they basically would, you know, say that it's it's kind of a, um, 
a misunderstanding to read the ancient uh, comedic texts. And, you know, when you see different gods and goddesses like Ra, um, you know, Isis, Osiris, and so forth, you know, uh, many times they're, they, they take umbrage in the notion that, you know, the ancient Egyptians were polytheists, meaning that they worshiped many different gods. The comedics would say, no, they didn't worship many different gods. In actuality, they only worshiped or, you know, gave reverence to the one and these different, um, you know, deities in the literature are actually just representatives of different forms of energy that all exist within that one, or as different expressions of, you know, the one. That's where you get the different, you know, deities. And they would say that's what, you know, the ancient Egyptians would, would, uh, would were subscribing to. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, they still take, you know, commandments today still take it that um, everything exists within the one. So that's kind of like what occupies the most high God spot. Now, within that, um, you also have, um, in terms of how they see themselves, if everything is just within the one, you know, this divine, you know, entity that encompasses all things, then you know, when it comes to human beings, they would believe that in that sense, we are divine, you know what I'm saying, because we are part of this divine entity, you know, everything is divine, thus, you know, we are divine. So they have a, a elevated view of man as not being, and from a Christian perspective, we would say that God is made in the image of God. They would say that, you know, man is indeed um, one and the same as God, in a sense. You're saying. Um, aside from that, uh, in terms of uh, their ethics, in terms of what they believe they ought to be doing in the world, so to speak, um, you have this concept of ma'at, you know, that you run into all the time. I mean, you, I don't think you can have a conversation with a comedic for, for five minutes without, you know, the concept of ma'at coming up. I mean, so if you engage them, you probably want to know what that is because they're constantly talking about it. So, you know, ma'at would, you know, uh, we were referred to as being like the goddess of righteousness, goodness, justice, reciprocity and so on. It's kind of like the uh, Ma'at was like the, the embodiment of all things that are good and right in the world and order. Now, let me take a step back and just say this too, because <clears throat> I'll be using terms right and wrong and good and evil throughout some of my other critiques. So I just want to clarify that comedics today, and also, you know, it's true about uh, apparently Egyptians in the, in the past, their notion of right and wrong uh, was uh, conceptualized in terms of chaos and order. So, you know, chaos would, you know, correspond with, you know, evil and order corresponded to what we would refer to as good. So they looked at, at the world in terms of chaos and, and order. And so comedics today would do the same thing. With that being said, they would say that ma'at is representative of order. You know what I'm saying? Everything that is good. And the opposite of ma'at would be isfet, uh, which represents chaos, evil, and so forth. And so there you have kind of like the nuts and bolts of, 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 uh, their general worldview, where you've got, you know, they believe everything exists within the one that kind of is this divine totality of everything that kind of occupies the most high God spot in uh, in their worldview. And, you know, obviously with that, you know, they believe that we are in some sense divine in that we are part of that totality. And, you know, they subscribe to Ma'at as being like this order uh, behind the world that that governs all things that are good. And even in a natural sense, they would say that that the order, say, for example, in, in nature itself, I'm saying that they will refer to that as being my eye. You know? Now, uh, lastly, I would say in terms of, I guess, if we could call it, you know, salvation or, or how they believe uh, we are to be uh, in right standing, you know, with you know the one or divinity or whatever you may look at it, um, it's, it's really a works-based system. It's really a works-based system. Now, uh, while most many people haven't heard of Kemeticism, if you do run into them, you'll often hear to them refer to the 42 laws of Ma'at or the 42 principles of Ma'at. And these principles are um, basically a list of uh, moral precepts that archaeologists discovered in certain funerary texts like the Book of the Dead and a certain coffin text and so forth. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the, these uh, precepts are a part of their mythological picture in terms of how they would enter into uh, the afterlife. And so in the, the Book of the Dead, which is also referred to as uh, the Book of Coming Forth by Day, again, it's a funerary text. And this in this funerary text, it describes the different uh, trials and things that a person would have to go to in order to enter the afterlife. And the last, um, you know, uh, the last hurdle, if you will, was an actual trial scene, like a like a court scene type of a deal, where you had to appear before the uh, the pantheon of different uh, divinities, and they would weigh your heart based upon how much evil you had done or hadn't done. And so, what they would, you know, what the comedics would do is they would confess, you know, these forty two uh, principles of Maat, saying, "I haven't stolen, or I haven't lied, I haven't done this, or I haven't done that." 
And the idea is that, you know, it's demonstrating that their heart is light enough um, to enter into um, uh, the afterlife. So they would, you know, your heart would be weighed against uh, a feather of ma'at, you know I'm saying, in the imagery. And if your heart came up lighter than, you know, or equal to uh, ma'at, then you'd be good to go to enter into the afterlife. But if not, you would be consumed by uh, another deity, which was Sekhmet, and basically be annihilated, if you will. And so, you know, you have this works-based system where you've got to, you know, if you ain't living it, <laughs> if, if you're not, you know, you know, meeting that checklist, so to speak, of do's and don'ts, then, uh, you know, it, it's not a picture of like, you know, the Christian worldview where you have, you know, Jesus stepping in to address the, the sin that dwells within all of us. It's pretty much a wrap, you know, on cometicism. You know, if, if your heart is too hard or your heart is too heavy, rather, uh, as in heavier than one of my feathers, then, you know, that's it. You, you're not going to make it you know, into, into the afterlife. So that's kind of like a broad sketch of, you know, what it is that they subscribe to. Yeah, that's extremely helpful. Um, when we think about Cometicism and we think about their critiques on Christianity, one has been that it's a copycat religion. Um, can you share a little bit about why they think that? <laughs> yes, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. So um, I guess in a nutshell, what they would say um, and by they, I, I do want to acknowledge that there are different angles that, that some of them take to it. But essentially, what they, the most common one you're going to find is this supposed uh, correlation or connection between Jesus and Horus. I'm saying uh, that would be one of them. So they would say that the the things that the Bible says about Jesus are actually um, said about Horus, you know, in, in texts that predate the Gospels, and therefore that's evidence. Uh, that, you know that you know that parallel is evidence that you know the the that Jesus is a myth that was you know, taken from Kemet. So let me just give a quick example. I guess probably maybe the most uh, familiar one might be uh, this notion that Jesus was born on December 25th, because <clears throat> that's when we celebrate Christmas. And then um, they would say the horse was born on December 25th as well in a similar type of scene. And there you go, you got some kind of parallel that, that, that you know, demonstrates that, that the, uh, the narrative about Christ was taken from Kemet. That's what they would say. Uh, but obviously, you know, when you're, you're dealing with these kinds of claims, you want to look into primary sources and see if these claims hold up. Is it the case that the evidence uh, about, you know, when Jesus was born is what they claim? And is it the case that the evidence about, um, you know, when Horace was born uh, is, is that the case? Now, when you think about it, I mean, right off the bat, the argument loses steam because uh, there is no part of Christian doctrine, nor is it in scripture anywhere that Jesus was born on December 25th. That may be a common cultural practice, you know, but that, there's no doctrine or piece of scripture that uh, commits, you know, the Christian to affirming that Jesus was actually born on December 25th. So half of that parallel is already out the window. But the other side of it is, is actually when you study uh, the primary sources, and particularly looking at the calendar, the Egyptian ancient Egyptian calendar, uh, the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians had what they called epigominal days. OK, now the epigominal days were five days at the end of August upon which they celebrated the birth of the gods. And so each of those days, you know, they would celebrate one of the um, one of the different gods or goddesses. Um, and the second of those days, they they took to celebrate Horus. And so if there was some sort of birthday celebrated in ancient ancient um, Egypt, it would have been somewhere at the end of August, not December 25th. You know, so, you know, again, you know, on both sides, then this whole this notion about December 25th being a connecting point between Jesus and Horus on both sides, it falls apart because in neither case do the primary sources attest to you know, Jesus um, or Horus being born on that date. So that would be, you know, one example of the kind of parallels they try to draw. There, maybe another popular one would probably be this notion of the Trinity. They would say that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit um, is a ripoff of, you know, what they refer to as either um, Horus, Isis, and Osiris. They would actually probably correct me and say, no, it's not, you know, you got to use the indigenous term. So Asar, Aset, and Haru, right? Um, or uh, you know, you know, father, mother, and child. You know, they would say that that those uh, trinities in their tradition predate. You know, what we refer to as as, as the uh, the Trinity. Again, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the problem is, like, once you start, you know, really dissecting it, they're focusing on basically the commonality of three, but they ignore all the dissimilarities. <laughs> I'm saying that that demonstrate that these two concepts are clearly different. So, for just to name one, um, Horace. Is, is a in some sense or another a created being. There was a time when Horus did not exist. How do we know that? Well, because he was brought into being by Isis and Osiris having you know sexual intercourse. So obviously he could not have existed in in you know in terms of being Horus prior to that. 
Whereas there's not one member of the Trinity that has not existed. I'm saying the Trinity, all three members of them are past eternal and eternal in the future as well. So, you know, once you start getting into differences like that, I mean, and I could, I could you know, throw out some other ones as well, but there are a number of dissimilarities that these individuals don't take into account when they try to draw a parallel between something that they see in Kemet and something that they see in the Christian tradition. And so they would try to say that, you know, Christianity is a ripoff based on these kinds of parallels. But again, once you start dissecting them, I mean, they really just fall apart. What do you think the biggest draw uh, for young people today for millennials, for Gen Z, um, as it relates to Kemeticism? What do you think is at the core of why people um, would buy into these ideals? Oh, man. I mean, really, I think that, um, well, I'll, I'll put it this way. When you think about the major views that are um, prominent in the conscious community today, you know, you have like the Kemetics, you have the Moors, you have the um, the Hebrew Israelites, uh, and then you have, um, I'm leaving, I'm leaving out somebody, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, Kemetics, Moors, Hebrew Israelites. What's that? Nation of Islam. Even Nation of Islam. Islam. Thank you. Thank you. You know what I'm saying? So all of these um, different worldviews, are, when it comes to black folks, are generally going to take the, the the same first step. They want to uh, get you to believe, basically, that there's some discord between being a Christian and being, um, uh, you know, being a Christian and being of African descent, being a person of African descent. And that's actually, you know, rooted in this this idea that we were, of course, you know, taken from Africa, you know, taken from West Africa, what have you, and you know, had our culture stripped away, had our beliefs stripped away, so on and so forth, which has left this like identity hole. And so the Kemetics, along with these other groups, are trying to fill that hole with something that they believe to be African while casting off what they believe to be European, i.e., you know, they believe that would be Christianity. So in the process of shedding off, you know, what is European and trying to, you know, reclaim what is African, you know, uh, which they believe to be more in line with your indigenous uh, heritage, that's where they, they're going to take the first step and try to, you know, draw you in. So they that, that's pretty much what they offer, you know, this, this belief that, hey, you know, uh, all these other worldviews doesn't come from us. You know, it just, it's not representative of us, you know, as African people. We need to get back to what our ancestors were about. And Kemeticism is more in line with that. It's more um, in sync with who you are. Um, just to kind of me using a quick analogy, all worldviews are like a puzzle. And, and by worldview, I mean just kind of the lens through which you view, you know, the world. Um, and, you know, they're all like a puzzle. They're like a, a compilation of everything that we believe uh, about the world and saying everything we believe to be true about the world. So basically what Kometics are saying is that the Christianity puzzle piece or any any sort of worldview that's kind of like European, that puzzle piece of your worldview is out of sync with your identity puzzle piece and it's clashing. So what you need to do is get rid of you know that other your, that religious uh, puzzle piece that's not in line with you with who you are as a black person, a person of African descent, and adopt some other worldview that will fit you know, um, so that both your who you are as, as a person of African descent and your you know uh, spirituality or religious practice will you know mesh together. So that's kind of where they're coming from, and I think that's that's really the major draw. I mean, they they uh, you know really want to push that, which is why it's so important. With, you know, like what you're doing, you know, folks like Bantu, you know, myself, and all these urban apologists out here is really breaking down uh, that myth. I mean, it's obviously not the case that there's something that is uh, endemic or inherent about Christianity that it doesn't accord with who I am as a person of African descent. I mean, I'm not gonna, I, I could do my best uh, Vince Bantu impression to try to run down some, some history of, of Christianity in Africa, but you got a lot of stuff on down on your channel, so I, I'll, I'll digress there. So I think that's uh, extremely helpful to note when engaging, because like, like you said, there are so many different sects of Kemeticism that sometimes people think if I just get these principles down, then I'll be able to engage them. Um, to, Easily, uh, without knowing that you have to really, really get to the core and then work your way out to to their beliefs to kind of get a footing in with them. Sometimes, um, yeah. in in your um, experience with engagement, for those who feel like intimidated when their cousin or uncle or brother or sister has gotten into cometicism and they're like, "Man, I don't know half of the stuff Adam knows. I don't yeah. even know." maybe 10 percent of it and i feel so intimidated by the conversation that i just disengage and then that my cousin or my uncle my brother or sister thinks that i'm my faith is useless because i can't engage them on that level what would you recommend um how would you recommend they engage 
Great, great. So what I can probably do is give um, like three quick examples, uh, maybe kind of going from the simplest to, you know, maybe the more complex, you know, if that would be helpful. Um, yeah. so the simplest um, you know, advice I can give, and, and this is something that I would just apply to not only comedics, but really all of the world we, worldviews that we engage is so many times. Now, this, I, have, I have to be honest, this is one of my personal pet peeves. <laughs> OK, you know, so many times when we're engaged in other folks, we put all the burden of the conversation on us. And we're always the ones that are you know, defending Christianity and we don't put you know, the burden of proof on them. The reality is all of these different worldviews are making claims about how the world is. You know, we're saying that there is one most high God. They're saying, no, that's not the case. Uh, everything is God. OK, well, they're making a claim about how things are. And just a general you know, uh, guideline of discourse or debate is that anybody who makes a claim, it's upon them to defend that claim. But what happens is so often, um, you know, we put all this pressure on ourselves. Somebody's like, oh, man, Christianity is a white man religion or, you know, uh, chemeticism is true that Christianity is garbage. And we immediately go into defense mode or trying to give reasons as to why, you know, we, we hold to what we hold to. But we don't take you know, a step back and just ask questions. OK, well, you know, if, Christ, if, if you believe chemeticism is true and actually I think this is probably the most, you know, uh, maybe one of the most crucial pushbacks against chemeticism is that if you believe chemeticism is true. Cool. Where's the evidence? What evidence can you provide to demonstrate that your worldview is true in the sense that it aligns with reality? I think that's that's the number one thing that I would impress upon people. Ask questions. Right now, most often what you'll hear people say or yeah, yeah, I say most often what you hear people say is, well, you know, the ancestors believed dot, dot, dot. Now, the thing about that is just because the ancestors believe something that, you know, that may answer the question as to what they believe, but it doesn't answer the question of whether or not what they believe is true. Right. So we think about it. If I were to let's say you have a person who traces their lineage back to whatever particular West African people or let's say they trace it back to Kim, just to kind of keep it there. Right. Somehow they're descendant of people who are actually ancient Egyptians. So let's say they trace their lineage back. They could give a full description of what their uh, ancestors believed. They know exactly what they were about. Again, that would you know they'd be able to answer the question of what it was that they that their ancestors believed. But that wouldn't answer the question of whether or not what those folks believed was true. You know, so it's not enough to say the ancestors believed it. You got to give me some evidence to, you know, um, that that gives me good reason to affirm that you know what it, your worldview is actually correct. So that would be number one. You know, don't put the pressure all on yourself. Um, you know, make sure you ask lots of good questions. You know, and allow them to defend their position. Don't put it all on you. So that's number one. Number two, um, I would highly recommend. I would highly recommend. Um, that people get a good grasp of the, the basics of the faith in terms of, you know, why it is that we affirm Jesus is uh, Jesus is God, uh, why it is that we affirm that God is a Trinity, and certainly um, the historical evidences for the resurrection. Um, you know, there, there's a guy named, um, or two guys, actually, Dr. Michael Lacona and also Gary Habermas, who's written a book called The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it presents what they call the, the minimal facts argument. Uh, for the resurrection of Jesus. And so this argument, you know, points to things like, um, well, they would point to, I guess, a number of different facts uh, surrounding the, um, you know, the resurrection that historians affirm to be historically credible. You know, one would be that Jesus was crucified, you know, uh, by the Romans. Uh, two would be that the disciples had experiences which they believed to be encounters with the bodily risen Jesus. Um, also, uh, the, the, the tomb of Jesus was found empty. Uh, you have the conversion of Paul uh, to Christianity and the conversion of James. They would take those five facts. And, you know, let me just say, these aren't just like faith statements. You know what I'm saying? The reason why I'm saying the five facts is because um, they're well attested to in the historical record. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, uh, upwards of 90 percent of the uh, scholars of antiquity who study these kinds of things would affirm uh, at least four of those those five facts as being historical, with the exception being th that the uh, the empty tomb, which even still two third between two thirds and seventy five percent of scholars would affirm uh, that uh, Jesus' tomb was indeed found empty. So what happens is, you know, with these five facts in mind, the, the historian then has to ask, well, what explanation best accounts for these five facts? And they look at things like, you know, what can explain each uh, fact individually, which can explain which explanation can explain all the facts taken together, and things of that nature. And what you find is there's no naturalistic um, explanation for these five facts that it can account for all five of them adequately, right? 
Uh, but there is one explanation that the church has, stand, has stood on for about 2,000 years now that can account for all the, these five facts, which is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, that's just a snapshot of it, you know, but, and, you know, so I would encourage people to go uh, check out Lacona and Habermas. But just in a nutshell, that's a minimal facts argument. Now, the significance of that is if you can really, you know, get that evidence down, then what you have is a, a, a piece of historical evidence that points to the, um, the veracity or the, the truthfulness of the biblical worldview of the gospel that's something that you cannot that cannot be said about cometicism they can't point to any sort of historical evidence and i would argue they can't point to philosophical evidence either that would you know um demonstrate that their worldview um is in fact true so uh first of all you know we want to make sure that we're that we're not um always keeping the ball in our court in terms of having to defend uh worldviews if you have a, a you know brother sister cousin whoever it may be you know, that, that cousin that shows up to the family cookout, you know, his last, you know, his name is George, but now he's Shabazz or something like that, you know, you know, <laughs> um, ask questions, you know what I'm saying? Like, don't put it all on you. You know, they say, oh yeah, I rock with this chemist stuff. Okay, cool. Why? What's the evidence? What evidence can you bring to me that would suggest that your worldview is true? And then secondly, we have evidence of our own, and there's much more that I can go into for that, but you know, uh, with the resurrection, that gives us, that's one example of a piece of evidence that sets Christianity apart from worldviews like Hermeticism. Now, I want to take, actually, if you don't mind, um, so we've kind of gone from simple to, I, I would say, maybe a medium-sized argument. Um, and I would just take like two seconds just to kind of give an example of maybe a, another argument that's more in depth. Um, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. All right, cool. So one thing I want people to think about is that all worldviews, again, are kind of like a puzzle. I'm saying now with any puzzle, you've got like your the outer pieces that are kind of like that, that help you define everything else in the puzzle. So usually you start with the outside first. So, you know, put it this way. All worldviews have like big chunk pieces and then you've got the, the other little pieces. Now, those big chunk pieces are going to have to do with, you know, metaphysics, like, you know, what they believe about God, uh, morality, you know, what they believe about mankind and things of that nature. Now, here's the thing. Just in a nutshell, when you when these big pieces, if you if you can demonstrate that two or more of these big pieces clash with one another, then that's evidence that there's something wrong with that worldview. It's a red flag that there's a problem with the worldview because that worldview, the different pieces aren't fitting together right. Now, I would argue that when, it, when you're dealing with cometicism, <clears throat> we can demonstrate specifically when it comes to issues of morality that there are pieces clashing within the worldview. You know, I'm telling you, I'm just, I'll give you a quick snapshot. People can actually go to my my uh, my podcast and check out a more full, full description of this argument here. But remember I said a minute ago, that they believe that everything exists within the one, okay? Everything exists within the one. So, um, and also noted that, you know, you have entities, you know, whether they be some sort of energy or whatever it may be, but you have this entity of ma'at, you know, which represents, you know, goodness, and you also have isfet. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> if everything exists within the one, right, then that means that this entity that they refer to as isfet or chaos, we refer to as evil. That exists within the one. All right. So that means that evil is a part of their most high being. OK. Now, if evil is a part of their most high being, then therefore their ultimate reality is morally flawed. Now, if you have a, a morally flawed <clears throat> most high being, then you're going to run into some serious problems when you're trying to develop a moral framework in terms of how you navigate moral issues in the world, okay? So for example, let's just think about just kind of make it more concrete, all right? You know, if everything exists within the one, then that means that the enslaved persons that they often, you know, uh, say, oh, Christianity is a bunch of slave owners, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, let's just talk about it. You know, if everything exists within the one, that means that the enslaved persons are a part of the one, but also the slave masters are also a part of the one as well because everything exists within the one. So on their moral framework, their God is both you know, the, the oppressed and the oppressor. If you bring it into the day, anytime you see uh, you know, on, on uh, the news, if, if uh, somebody gets shot unjustifiably by a police officer or something like that, well, on their worldview, their most high, the one, is both the victim and the shooter, right? So it, with that being the case, how can they ever make a, a solid stance against oppression? Because at the end of the day, whatever oppression that, you know, it is that we need to stand on, not stand against. Now, mind you, there's all sorts of stuff going on, you know, that we can see in our history and today that we need to contend against from, you know, in terms of justice and things of that nature. But from their worldview, the culprit behind all the evil and the oppression is the one, that, which is their most high. 
right? And so when we talk about the, you know the, our community, you know, and the things that we need to do to move forward as a people, cometicism can't help us here because the reality is on their worldview, you know, the enemy behind it all <laughs> is, is their most high being. I'm saying you can't you can't develop a community based on, on those kind of beliefs. The other side of it is this. So that, that's one problem. And, and there's actually a family of them. I won't get into all of them. But just real quick, and this kind of brings us around to the gospel. When you think about it, um, one thing that you hear comedics and also just more broadly, African spiritualists in general, they'll say things like as above, so below. I'm saying so as I mentioned, you know, they believe that, you know, we're part of the one. So in a sense, you know, we're, you know, we're divine or whatever, but we are a part of the one. Now, if evil is a part of the one and we're part of the one, you know, we're, you know, it's, then that means that evil is a part of us because whatever is true about the divine, about the one is true about us. So that means in the same way that evil is a part of the one, we'd have to conclude that evil is a part of us and it ain't going nowhere. It's, it's, it's an eternal part of who we are. Now, this flies in the face of the gospel. This flies in the face of the gospel because, you know, when God first created him and he made him in his image and he sat back and said that everything, including us, was good. Right. And even though sin has entered the world through, you know, through Adam and Eve and, through, and obviously continues on, you know, through you know, mankind, even now, there will come a time. You know I'm saying when Jesus returns, that all things will be made right. This is why the cross is so important. You know, what I'm saying, you know, that, you know, the, the evil that is that is a part of who we are now will be removed. We won't have to deal with this body of flesh. You know what I'm saying? We will be made new, right? And in the new kingdom. And so there we can look forward to a time where we won't have to contend with evil out there and in here. You know what I'm saying? But it, if cometicism is true, then that's not the case. If cometicism is true, then there is no answer for the evil that dwells within us because it's just a part of reality as you know in, in general anyway. And again, like I said, um, the one, if he is the culprit behind all evil in the first place, I mean, really, what's the point of contending against, you know, evil in the world when ultimately, you know, you have to attribute it to the one that you worship, I'm saying if you're, if you're a comedic. So, you know, that's kind of like a moral critique, you know, and if, you know, for my philosophical friends out there, you know, you'll, you'll know I'm kind of treading on the problem of evil there. I'm saying that the Christian world, you can give an account, given that we have a morally perfect being at the head of our, um, our worldview, we can give a better account of the problem of evil. Uh, than comedics uh, who subscribe to this kind of like pantheistic view, so to speak. So, you know, I mean, there's it's a number of different things that we can get into there, but I think those that that would be some like more of the uh, maybe some in-depth pushbacks. Now, I just want to say, you know, I'm always careful, you know, uh, just real quick, you know, just for my philosophy for, for philosophy friends out there, <clears throat> you know, some might some might say, well, what if evil doesn't exist? It's just as actuality is just you know exists as a negation. I mean, it's not a real thing in and of itself. You know, that's one defense of using Christianity. But I would just add that um, even if that were the case, those who are committing evil still exist within the one. And so still you have that moral flaw within their uh, their most high being, you know, the one. So I just want to kind of throw that in there for you know my folks who are real astute out there. But, yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a number of different ways that, that we can respond to comedics. Um, but, you know, first of all, before you respond, ask questions, make sure that you put the, uh, the onus on them to defend their, you know, to stand on their square, as we just say, you know, saying defend their worldview, get a good grasp of the resurrection, the Trinity. And um, Jesus, and just understand that with all these worldviews, there are implications not only for eternity, but also here and now. Because you know, if you don't get the gospel right, and you don't, you know, come to the cross and have your sins, you know, uh, wiped away, you know, that, which only comes through Jesus, then you know, obviously there are eternal implications for that. But in addition, not all worldviews are created equal. And so if you follow some of them to their logical conclusions, they class in such a way that they would inhibit us from living a moral life and contending for right for for good things here in, in this world. That's extremely helpful. Um, I think a very, very uh, helpful way forward in engaging. And I love how you said put the burden on them because oftentimes I think they're used to doing their own polemics. Yeah. Um, and they aren't good comedic apologists um, to be able to defend their their position. They're only mm -hmm. good at, at antagonizing others. Right. Um one of the things I could think about as we were talking about pushback in case for resurrection and Mike has been on the podcast, Mike Lacona talking about the resurrection. We haven't had Gary Habermas, but he was a professor at um, the school I went to for, um, for seminary. People say, well, those are white men um, giving us uh, the, the case for resurrection. Um, but it's interesting and others have pointed out this, that um, in an effort to escape 
uh, white supremacy, people don't realize that they're using white sources. Um, and not, I'm not talking about in the Christian worldview. I'm talking about in with these groups like cometicism and other comedics and other groups. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would refer people um, to a series of, of articles that I'm working on at freethinkingministries.com. Um, it's called again, it's called freethinkingministries.com. OK, and it's a <clears throat> it's an article. There's a series of articles that I refer to as ethnic epistemology. Right. Uh, so I won't break that down now, but just just so you can locate it on that website. That's uh, that's what it is now. Um, I can say two things about that real quick. One, in a nutshell, uh, there are certain things that have um, truth value. So let, let's say, for example, let's say I, I tell you to go out and find um, a plastic spoon on the beach. I got a plastic spoon. I just man, I just love that plastic spoon. I want you to go out to, to the beach and find it for me. And I'm going to give you a metal detector in order to find it, okay? Um, well, you're probably not gonna be too successful <laughs> at finding this plastic spoon because metal detectors aren't the right sort of tool for finding something that's made of plastic, right? So you can look around with that metal detector all day, you're not gonna find the thing. So likewise, when it comes to color, you know, when it comes to ethnicity, you have people trying to use ethnicity as a tool to discover certain truths about history, science, philosophy, and so forth. And what I'm saying is ethnicity is the wrong kind of tool to discover truths about certain areas like, um, you know, what we're talking about here, you know, whether Jesus existed or not, whether, um, uh, let's see, you know, whether, um, you know, the resurrection occurred or not, you know, those things, those are historical questions, right? And so you, you, you need it, you need historical tools to be able to discern, you know, the truth of, you know, whether or not those things are the case, right? So if people are just, you know, trying to use ethnicity, oh, well, this comes from a white person, that comes from a white person, so I can't rock with it. What I'm saying is that they're using their color, their more broadly, their ethnic heritage as a tool in a way that is not going to point them towards truth, okay? So that's kind of the general principle. With that being said, with comedic specifically, um, they're going to run into some problems. Because I, I don't care what sort of thing that they stand on, whatever we know about ancient Egypt, ancient Egypt today, you're going to have to go back to some white archaeologists that unearth, you know, whether it be the Rosetta Stone or whatever it may be. You're going to have to, you know, go to some white translators. So, for example, um, well, one of the main um, texts that they're often going to refer to is what's referred to, I, I mentioned earlier, as the Book of the Dead. Well, the, one of the main translations of the, the book of the dead was done by a white guy named Wallace Budge. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I mean, if, if you're going to say, if you're going to lob this criticism at Christianity uh, about, you know, using white sources, then once they go back to the things that they believe and start tracing back their own sources, they're going to find a bunch of white sources for those history books and so on that they stand on, you know, they, they give them the information that they stand on as well. And so they actually will undercut their own position. As a matter of fact, um, if you listen to a lot of them, um, many, much of what they believe traces back to some, you know, 19th century European uh, pseudo scholars, really, like Gerald Masser, Ger Gerald Massey, uh, Leo Frobenius, and some some other guys that, that we can name, um, who, you know, white guys who just had an infatuation with Egypt, you know, and you know, wrote some stuff. Now we know now that a lot of it's garbage, you know, but nevertheless, you know, these are things that you you often hear these folks, uh, you know, throw those names out. As a matter of fact, I think uh, Brother Jabbar, the, the uh, the um, comedic priest that I mentioned debated uh, Vince Banter. I think at the most recent debate, I think he mentioned Gerald, Gerald Massey, uh, who again was a white guy. You know, so if, if that you know if that criticism, if you if you believe that that criticism about white sources has any weight to it, then okay, if you're going to diss Christianity, then you need to get rid of comedicism as well, because the same critique can be made about y'all also. As a matter of fact, if I wanted to go further, we could also talk about how some of these newer newer uh, comedics are practicing things that you're not going to find in Egyptian text, but really a draw from new age, um, you know, kind of metaphysics and, and spirituality that, that traces back to uh, modern Europeans in, indeed. So, you know, that that's just not going to be a, a, a criticism that they can throw at us and not and, and get away with it. They're going to face that same, crit that same critique. When we think about new age cometicism that you were talking about, I, I mean, a cometicism mixed with new age spirituality. Talk about some of the practices that people are engaged in that you were referring to. Yeah, good. So, so what you actually have is a fusion of 
you know, kind of like maybe what they would see as their indigenous beliefs and then this new age stuff. So, for example, um, one thing that might be correct would be to say that if everything exists within the one, right, um, they usually attribute that to things even down to like energy. You're saying we're all made of energy. And if you want your energy to be in alignment with the universe, then, you know, there's ways that you can do that, you know, um, by really getting in touch with nature in a number of different ways. One of those ways might be the use of crystals, you know, to channel some sort of force or, or energy or what have you, or use of certain colors for this or, for, or in terms of that you're wearing that day to be in tune with a particular aspect of the, of the divine energy or divine nature, you know. Um, so, you know, so you'll see like a lot of uses, like, like I said, crystals and things of that nature. But, you know, that being said, a lot of that stuff is going to derive from just new age mysticism as well. You know what I'm saying like they may start with that kind of Egyptian flavored um, engagement of crystals and these physical things. Um, and then they're going to, you know, but in terms of how they actually practice it day to day, you know, they're reading books just like, you know, <laughs> Eastern, you know, mysticists, you know, uh, or mystical mystics rather, uh, just like everybody else, you know, so you're going to have that sort of, sort of fusion. Um, and I think, you know, again, that would be another area w that gives, um, the Christian opportunity to push back. Okay. Like you believe that you, you can draw, you know, this, uh, you know, force or whatever from, you know, this particular, uh, object. You know, what's your evidence for that? You know, how how do you go about explaining that? Right. I think that's super helpful. I was on Instagram the other day. I saw Omarion um, covering himself um, with some sage. Uh, oh, yeah, that's big nowadays. Yeah, that's sage. Yeah, <laughs> on that stage, man. Yeah. And, um, I was uh, looking at. Um, they have this show where I don't know if you've seen it, where it's like a, a psychiatrist and a rapper. Um, I don't know what know it what is. Talking about. Yeah. 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 You're with the water, right? Huh? You talking about the, the lady with the water, the crystals of the water and all that? No, no, it's oh, a, okay. it's a, it, um, I, it's on Fuse or one of those, one of those, um, channels. And, um, I don't know which, I don't know which new R&B singer it was, but, um, she saw that he's a psychiatrist, but he's also into the kind of new age. And she was like, I feel safe because you have these crystals. Um, like I feel like already connected in this space because of the crystals. Um, right. so it's a lot um going on around that. Um, how do you engage people? I know you say you ask questions when they're when they're like, I'm in the crystals and sage. Um, how are you engaging that? Before we go to that, I saw this. Me, okay. that was the most hilarious thing that said, um, uh, what if you uh, uh, burn sage in your room and you die because you realize you're the negative energy? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was but um, <laughs> how, yeah. how have you, outside of asking them questions, have you engaged? Because I don't think most people know how to. Yeah, it's a good question. So for me, I just, it's, it's so weird. I just had a conversation with somebody about this like two days ago. For me, I try to be cautious in the sense that I don't want to assume, um, you know, like how they're approaching it because different people do it in different ways. I mean, you could you could have some. So put it this way. There are some material things that do have certain maybe medicinal properties. I mean, you know, like herbs and things like that, you know, or um, there's. Yeah. So there are some physical things that have physical properties that can be a, maybe some, uh, you know, medicinal use or what have you. And perhaps, you know, there may be occasions where. Um, somebody has maybe even from ancient times has identified that and then layered on some theology to it, you know, that's, that's incorrect, but nevertheless, there's that physical property that exists, you know? So I, you know, so again, I wouldn't necessarily throw the baby out with the bathwater with respect to like, you know, people using herbs and stuff like that to take care of their body or, um, you know, but when you start getting into the, the other side, you know, the heavier stuff, when it comes to like crystals and things of that nature, the first thing I want to find out is, you know, what are you getting from it? You know, what is it, what is your purpose behind, um, uh, you know, you, you, um, you know, using this particular stone or, or what have you. And once they can identify that, like, say, they're trying to, you know, get rid of evil in the room or, you know, you know whatever it may be. At that point, that's what I'm going to explain the gospel. I'm going to explain the aspect of the gospel that addresses the need they're trying to um, they're trying to address because they're trying to address a need. They, they believe that there's something that they need from this stone. And so, or from that sage or whatever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain the aspect of the biblical worldview that deals with that need. And then I'm going to give evidence for the biblical worldview, such as, you know, the uh, evidence for the resurrection or maybe a moral argument or whatever it may be. Um, I'm going to give evidence for the, for, uh, the biblical worldview such that I can say, okay, I've given you 
uh, a solution for your problem. And here are the reasons why I believe that this, um, I affirm that, that the book of worldview is true, you know, and can thus meet your, your, your need. And then um, at that point, after I explain that, I'll probably then go back to him and say, we can maybe have a dialogue then about, again, you know, why, why are you engaging in this thing? And hey, here's this evidence I presented you over here. You know, why not engage that? Because I'm, I'm demonstrated to you that it's that it's true. Mm -hmm. That's extremely helpful because it, a lot of it is around removing negative energy. And so when we think about removing negative energy, what they're searching for is some kind of peace. Um, yeah, yeah. And how does the gospel bring peace? To the soul and what peace really is because peace isn't the absence of negativity or chaos um right. peace the presence of god go. um, um i think you know trying to remove all the negative out of your life really just removes everything from your life even yourself honestly um, yeah. all, it'd be a wrap for everybody we'd all be done <laughs> everybody <laughs> <to> disappear. <laughs> people are trying to get to a place that really doesn't exist in life um, well, see, to your point, though, and again, this is something that I think that we really need to, um, you know, maybe be more attentive to is that all these worldviews are trying to solve problems. You know I'm saying there are certain problems that we're all running into in this human experience. And these different worldviews are trying to make sense of or solve these different problems. And so many times we jump to the evidence for Christianity without identifying the need or the specific problem that is maybe central in that person's life, you know, what it, what it is that they are most concerned about. If we can take time to ask questions and identify those needs, then it can maybe help us to streamline our argumentation or maybe kind of um, cater our presentation of the gospel in such a way that it helps them to see that the biblical worldview is what it's going to take to resolve that need. Yeah. But being good listeners, I think, is, is, is really key. Yeah. Listening, I think, is the greatest key. Um, to to apologetics today, and I always yeah. say uh, people have roots to their que questions have roots, and oftentimes we don't listen to get to the root. We just start engaging the questions up front. So right. Right. Um, it's been a fantastic time, um, Adam. Uh, I think this was very very helpful. Um, for those, what would be your final thoughts uh, about this subject and anything we've discussed? Sure. Yeah. So uh, final thoughts would be um, really something I say all the time, man, is that, you know, as Christians, we need to um, be sure, you know, that we're they're giving our efforts to knowing what it is that we believe, why we, you know, what we affirm, why we affirm it, and, you know, really practice in terms of how we can articulate it to others. I mean, I think that's so key. That's what apologetics is, is really all about. And it's not just about engaging, engaging questions. It's about engaging people. You know what I'm saying? We want to make sure that we're keeping the person in focus rather than just like stacking up ammunition to go, you know, beat somebody up online or, or at the next family cookout or something like that. You know, you know, we don't want to be that way, you know, but, you know, definitely uh, for, I would just encourage people out there to avail yourself to the various different uh, resources that are out there, um, you know, for Christians to beef up, you know, the knowledge of, you know, what it is that we affirm and why we affirm it uh, in terms of the biblical worldview and will help them to kind of, uh, you know, uh, share those things with others. So um, yeah, man, it's, so, you know, and I guess, you know, shameless plug, you know, one way of doing that would be to check out the True ID podcast, <laughs> you know, at truidpodcast.com. Also, I've been doing a lot more work on uh, YouTube. You know, I've been doing a lot, more, putting out a lot more YouTube videos. Uh, so definitely check me out at youtube.com slash True ID Apologetics. It's T-R-U-I-D Apologetics. Uh, Free Thinking Ministries. Uh, shout out to my people um, at the King Movement. Um, let me think. I'll make sure I don't leave anybody out. The Mentionables. And everybody else that I ride with, man. So, you know, just uh, shout out to all the folks out there. But and uh, and yeah, also trueideapologetics.com. That's like kind of like my main website. So I got articles there and stuff uh, as well. So, you know, study, study and then get out there and make a difference. What would be some books that you would recommend that our audience read on these subjects? Ooh, man, that's good. So um, kind of going back to the three. Uh, recommendation I gave in terms of how to engage people. I talked about asking questions to you know get clarity and and put the the burden of proof on them. I talked about the resurrection and I talked about um, uh, morality. Um, along those lines, uh, I certainly would recommend uh, Greg Kokel's book. I think he just, he just released the second edition. It's a, a yeah. edition of tactics. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I certainly would recommend 
uh, Greg Kogel's book called Tactics. There you go. Right there. You're right there. You're All right. Got your copy. I, I see you. I still got the first one. So I got I got to upgrade now. You know what I'm saying? This is like the iPhone. You know what I mean? You got to <laughs> you have to get that new one. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, definitely I would recommend that because it'll give you some steps on how to engage those conversations. Because we can all have a bunch of information, but if you're not able to get, engage in conversation, then the information is, is, is not going to do so much good. So definitely with tactics, uh, I recommend that. Um, I would also, again, recommend uh, uh, Lacona and Habermas's book, <clears throat> uh, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, if you really want to get deep, you know, you got to go to my boy N.T. Wright. You know what I'm saying? He's got this huge book. This is kind of one of those. If you drop it on your foot, it probably break your toe, <laughs> you know, called The uh, the Resurrection of, of the Son of God. And um, then in terms of uh, comedic specifically, um, I would recommend. Well, unfortunately, you know, there hasn't been a book written on them, <clears throat> you know, it, it, an entire book right, rather uh, written on them. But there's a guy I know named Tyron Laws who has a book on urban apologetics. <clears throat> Excuse me. That I would highly recommend. It's called the uh, the round table, I believe. Tyrone Laws and uh, Rashad uh, Armand. Uh, so I definitely would recommend that. And um, On Guard by William Lane Craig. I'm saying I definitely would recommend On Guard by William Lane Craig. But he'll give you uh, a set of basic arguments that once you finish that book, you have a, a, sh a sharp enough um, sword, so to speak. You know what I'm saying to be able to you know really navigate uh, these kinds of conversations and and give it up, give evidence for the biblical worldview. <clears throat> Dope, dope. Um, that is extremely, extremely helpful. Um, and you're at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all of those at True ID? Uh, actually, Twitter, I think I'm Scott Lane 7. I'm like the laziest Twitter, Twitterer, tweeter alive. Like, I'm, I'm really <laughs> whack. <laughs> but, but, you know, subscribe to me anyway. Engage you. The best way to, to engage me is Facebook. I spend a lot of time on Facebook, probably too much time, but, uh, you know, I'm definitely on there. De well, you can check out the True ID page it actually has a has a page for true id uh so you can def definitely check me out on that or adam coleman you know just check me out on facebook but scott lane seven on um on uh twitter and uh true id i think true id seven on instagram i believe yeah and also your booking information is on on your website correct yeah booking information is on the website um that's actually something i'm doing uh new in 2020 uh, like I said, a minute, uh, you know, about two years ago, I started getting speaking engagements. So I'm, I'm definitely open for that. People can hit me up at truidapologetics.com, uh, truidapologetics.com uh, for booking. Uh, but also I'm doing uh, more seminars now, you know, so whereas before, you know, I would come out and speak on one particular topic, uh, but now I'm broadening that out some to where I'll come out, you know, maybe do like an opening topic on a Friday night and Saturday we'll work through these different worldviews in a number of sessions so that by the end of that two days, you've got a solid handle um, on you know, what it is you might be engaging in your community. And I especially recommend it for you know, uh, churches out there who are serious about evangelism in their areas because uh, there are these worldviews that are gaining traction right under our noses that we aren't taking time to equip ourselves with. And so when we run into them, when that evangelism team or folks in our ministry team run into them in the community, they're not familiar with it. So that's what you know, I kind of can come in there and, and maybe give people some insight so that by the end of that of our seminar, the True ID seminar, they're able to kind of engage those groups. So True ID Apologetics uh, at Gmail, you know, would be um, the way to reach me there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Adam. This has been a rich time. Remember here at the G3 Project, we're helping you know what you believe and why you believe it. You could get our new curriculum through Eyes of Color, um, a contextualized guide. Um, a contextualized guy. I'm forgetting the, the subtitle, uh, but you can do that at g3project.org. You can see the website right there. Um, you can take our online course at learn at g3project.org and get your merch at g3project.org. Until next time, uh, we thank you. And also you can donate to us and become a monthly su subscriber. We thank all of you for the, for, we thank our monthly, I'm sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. We thank, <laughs> we're thankful for our monthly subscribers that um, support us every month. Um, we couldn't do what we do without you. Every gift helps equip. You could go to ju3project.org and hit donate. You can either donate by mail or you can donate online. Thank you again. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.